Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. I, I, I want you to know I was touched by that not wanting to bore anybody thing. That really goes right to my heart, sweetheart. We're very close, Penny and I, as you can see. She knows me very well. Thank you so much. Thanks especially to those of you who um, have seen me before and despite that came today anyway. It's, oh, God. Well, that you said to yourself, well, the breakout sessions will be good at least. I'll go to those. So I thank you. And um, I, I, if you have heard me before, you'll know my theme of stickiness. If you don't remember anything else I say, remember that word because that's going to be the lesson for the day. If you've heard me speak before, you've heard me talk about being sticky. It is the single challenge you face. And if you're not sticky, don't bother. I'm going to go that far. In fact, Penny said to me, um, sort of, you know, you don't have to give like the comfortable everybody at ease with it conversation, and I don't do that anymore. It turns out I turned 50 this summer, and I've decided now that I'm an old fart, I'm not going to mince words anymore with telling people, oh, we're doing a great job, we're making progress, got to keep shipping away, incremental success is, su is sufficient. I don't believe any of that. I honestly, I don't. I don't believe it, so I'm not saying it anymore. And, and here's why. I had, it brought home to me, I told Penny this story, and she said, you know, share this story. I think it's kind of relevant that, you know, now that you are turning very old, apparently, as, since she's 29, she can make those judgments. Turns out this, as, as, as uh, I have a friend who's an editor with Backpacker Magazine, and we have, over the years, uh, uh, gone hiking and climbing and done stuff together. And, and every year he kind of concocts another challenge. This year's challenge, he said, We've done some long distance hikes together. Last year we tried, we in fact successfully hiked the Grand Canyon from the South Rim to the North Rim and back in one day, about 17 hours. It's 44 miles, 11,000 feet of vertical. He does these things so he has a great thing to write about for the magazine, but also as a life adventure. And the intent is that there's some doubt. Will, it, will we be successful? In other words, we try to make these real challenges. So this year, because we're turning 50, he concocted the idea of us trying to walk 50 miles nonstop across Zion National Park. It's one of the great southwestern parks. It is stunning country. If you've never been there, put it on your short list of places to get before you die. Here's a shot of me on what's called the West Rim Trail at about mile 29. Uh, we started at 3 in the morning, headlamps on our heads the whole bit. We were, the intent was to finish at 11 o'clock. and We started in the northwest corner of the park and in the southeast corner of the park. And I'm not actually telling all, you all of this so you think, oh, wow, what a serious hiker he is. The real interesting thing of this whole hike was that at about the 37-mile point, my wife and daughter who came and actually were, God bless them, sort of support crew, they actually met us at a couple of points coming in on side trails with food resupplies because we travel with very light packs so we can move quickly because to maintain that kind of a pace over very rough terrain, over that duration is physically quite challenging. And if, if you've got to carry a 40 pound pack, you're dead. But if you can carry 20 pounds, just your water, food, emergency gear, you can move much more quickly. So indeed we met them. And at one point in Zion National Park is a thing called Angel's Landing, which is this very skinny spine of rock that sticks out into the canyon. Anybody ever been on it? It's called Angel's Landing because it looks like only angels would be able to alight atop it. It, is, it really is wild. But there is in fact a a very precipitous walk out to it. And my daughter, bless her soul, and my wife met us at the 37 mile point. That's us looking down from the edge of Angel's Landing down into Zion Canyon, which is about 1,200 feet below. So you don't want to fall. They actually put chains there, the National Park Service, but you're still at grave risk. They have the little warning sign that says, if you are pregnant or you know frightened of heights, don't go out here if there's lightning. Highlight of the hike, highlight of the hike for me was that my daughter, who hiked in the side trail to meet us at this point, first words when she saw us, now we're at mile 37 of our 50 mile hike. How you doing? Are you okay, dad? Yep, we're doing great. She goes, you ready to do it? She's gonna go do Angel's Landing with me. She says, scramble out onto the thing, because that was part of our hike. To get our 50 mile total, we had to go out and back. And bless her soul, she scampered out there like a mountain goat. I could barely keep up with her. We cruised out there. Here she is doing one of the very precipitous sections. That's literally an 800 foot drop right there. And it's all sandstone. You're thinking, what kind of a loser parent is this guy <laughs> that he brings this 13 year old? There's a point to this story. And the point is simply this. It drove home two really important things and why I'm not mincing words on this anymore. One, I feel blessed and fortunate that my wife aligns with me on our view about nutrition and physical activity in our household and that we're imparting that to my daughter, 13, my son, 15, that they live this lifestyle. I feel we really are blessed. I think that is a blessing that we have the ability, the wherewithal, the education and the inclination to, to teach our kids that. That's not the case for every kid in America right now. 
In fact, for many, it's, many parents don't have the ability. Maybe they don't have the knowledge. Maybe they're a single parent working two jobs. They don't have the time to engage with children. So it really, I truly recognize that it's a gift. The second thing is, I believe that every kid in America is on a cliff just about that steep, about to fall off. Because that's how grim the health prospects are for that generation. And I am not exaggerating when I say I believe it is at least that steep. In fact, quite frankly, the risks to my daughter in that picture are more apparent and more controllable than the risk factors young people growing up today are now facing. Particularly around the evil triad, physical inactivity, poor nutrition, and tobacco. The big three. Which are, in fact, the primary causes of premature death in our society. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody in this room knows that data, can probably tell me about the state data, your county data. You got it all. So, that's my real reminder of my little hike, that that is how precipitous the problem we face is and how important it is we not mince words, we not pat ourselves on the back for our small incremental successes and say we have to actually change society at a wholesale, massive level. And that's the talk I'm going to give you. So my apologies in advance if that makes you squirm a little, but my job is to be in the squirmer. I'm supposed to make you squirm. If you're comfortable with where you are right now, that's not a good thing. So if you're okay with that, I'm going to go ahead and challenge you because I think that's the best thing we can do is continue to challenge ourselves to do better. And I'm going to do it by touching on these handful of things. Open up with a little more perspective built on what we were just talking about. You have to hear my rant. I'm sure many of you have heard my rant before if you've heard me speak. Everybody Everybody hears the Fenton rant. It's the price of admission, so you're going to get it. Then I'm going to talk about setting priorities. You have finite time. You have finite resources. You say, Mark, I'm happy with my incremental success because i got so much else to do. And I'm going to say, then maybe we have to spend our time differently because we can't keep putting up with small progress here. And I'm going to actually talk very specifically, as I said before, about stickiness and how we tackle that. And I'm going to conclude with one or two stories about why I think it matters so much. With that, you'll also notice I'm using a lot of photos from the area. I was lucky enough to be up in Essex County last year at a, at a smaller um, a gathering. So I've got uh, photos from up there that Jessica and others have shared with me, as well as ones that I took. And from here, and I thank Kathy Varney for some of the photos from down here in the Glens Falls areas that she shared as well. Um, plus from my previous visit. So that said, do a little favor for me. If you've done this before me, with me before, indulge me. Think back to your earliest fond recollection of having been physically active as a youngster. So you're going to go back and think as far back as your memory tapes can take you. And I'm not talking like high school sports. I'm talking like little kids, like the kids in the photos here, okay? Think back to there. And then I want you to turn to the person next to you and just share for 10 seconds each your recollection of being physically active as a very little kid. So it's a 20 second exercise total. Everybody got it? Go, right now. What's yours? I remember climbing up on the rocks in my backyard. Good, cool. Um, Marianne, what did you say? Cool. Did they live nearby? Yeah, I hate boy cousins. I was with a girl. Oh, really? Yeah. So you no, no slowing down, man. You had to go. Slip and slide. Oh, excellent. A great one. What did you say? Uh, sledding. Oh, great. We said playing in the creek and building forts. Josh, what was yours? I was telling you what mine was pretty much my parents telling me, go outside, don't come back till it starts. <laughs> with a key, right? Okay, guys. All right. Now, I know it would be far more fun to do that than listen to me for the next hour because it really, it is true. It's, isn't it fun to sort of pull those memories back up? And in fact, you know, and, and by the way, people get all active when they're telling the story. They tell climbing trees, they're acting things out, riding bikes, even though you really ride your bike like this, not like this, but you have to. And, you know, and, and I heard interesting things playing in the neighborhood creek, the slip and slide in the backyard, playing with her eight boy cousins, only girl in the group, so I had to keep up with them. Josh remembers being sent out of the house and told, just don't come back till it gets dark. <laughs> It's a classic male scenario. Get out of that, get out, you and all of your stinky friends, out of the house. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I want you to raise your hand if your recollection is affirmative. That is, if your answer is affirmative regarding the recollection you had. How many of you did you recall being with kids of only the same age and gender? So you're only with, if you were a 12 year old girl, you're only with 12 year old girls. Okay. How many remember an adult having to be present for the activity you recall? How many remember it being at a scheduled time and place? How many remember a uniform being an important part of the activity that you recall? 
How about an umpire or a referee being a part of the recollection? So not a lot for that. How many of you remember being with kids of different ages and different genders? So what was ever available. How many remember it being not at a specific time or place? Could happen anywhere. Anytime? How many remember an adult not having to be present necessarily? Who could not have gotten away with what they were doing if an adult had in fact <laughs> been present? Two hands on that. Wonder what he was up to. Um, how many remember a wheeled vehicle? So roller skates, you remember the old roller skates that needed a key. But a bike, a trike, roller skates, skateboard, something with wheels on it, a big wheel. How many remember water being part of your recollection? So you remember playing in the creek and damming it up. We used to dam up the creek, make little you know, ponds, and then try to catch pollywogs and stuff like that. If, you were, if I were to oversimplify it, who remembers to some degree or another sort of being a free range kid? That, that if, you say, if you say, yeah, I guess I was kind of a free range kid, hands up. Okay, two last questions. They're the only part of the thing that matters, if you ask me. They're the, they're the part of the story. How many of you believe the majority of children today, over 50%, are free range kids? Okay, that's interesting. How many believe it's good for their health that they're not free range? That we're, we're doing them a great favor to not have free range kids, that they're, they're much healthier. We're fighting the childhood obesity epidemic by them not being free range. So you're putting your hand up, and why is it good for their health that they're not free range? Well, we're not too much good for their health, but good for like, their safety. Absolutely, because it's much more dangerous out there, right? Kids are being plucked from the street every day by psycho guys with big, thick mustaches who are lurking <laughs> behind every tree. Tell me, please, somebody in the room, tell me. Over the last 40 years, from 1970 to about 2000, data tell us the number of kids walking and bicycling school to school went from 50% to 10 to 12%. And over the same time span, the number of kids being driven by a car went from about 10% up to 50%. So they almost identically swapped. Over that time span, tell me the percentage increase in violent crime against kids by people who don't know them. Weirdo abductors like me stealing kids off the street. The percentage increase, who knows the answer? Is it 100%? Did it double? Is it 500%? Is it five times worse? 10,000%, what's the number? You're holding up a number? Oh, that's the number, zero? You really think that? Do you know it or do you think it? Have you, have you read it? Did you happen to perhaps read it in that special issue of Time Magazine, The Case Against Overparenting, in which they said, in fact, there is no evidence that there is this dramatic increase, that the kid, in fact, would be no safer necessarily. We think that, We've been told that, and the media heightens that by telling us if there's an Amber Alert in California right now, we know about it here in New York. But we can't find the data to support that. I work with the National Center for Safe Routes to School in North Carolina. We've looked very hard at the longitudinal data. Now, let us agree, there are more single parent households. So there are few parents at home in some cases. There are more parents working two jobs. So kids end up being latchkey kids. Certainly there are dynamics that are different from a social standpoint. But the idea that, that there's this dramatic increase in violent crime against kids. Now let me say this. One thing that is different is roads are wider, traffic is faster, vehicles are bigger. So the, the physical landscape might be a little more intimidating. But I'm going to suggest to you, those are all things I can do something about. As opposed to the imaginary fear, which doesn't even really exist, I could actually remedy those things like traffic that's too fast in neighborhoods, couldn't I? If I actually knew how to do that. There's the challenge of the day. Just so you know, I don't think I'm so smart that I'm the only guy talking about this. Richard Louv, L-O-U-V, picture in the top right there, wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods. Anybody here read, read it? Did, was it great? It's a, it's, and it's a very engaging read, isn't it? He kind of catalogs the fact that kids simply don't spend time any outdoors anymore. He may well use the term free range kids, I can't recall, but um, a lot of people are starting to now. He talks about not only the, the physical challenges, that is the increased risk of obesity, for example, among kids that aren't physically active, type 2 diabetes, all that kind of stuff, but he also talks about the developmental challenges. He says, they are not developing the same skills that we developed as kids, the inventiveness, the creativity, when we had to go play by ourselves. In fact, Shane Gould, an Olympic swimmer, former Olympic swimmer in Australia, spoke out when I was at their National Physical Activity Conference there a, a couple of years ago, I was their keynote speaker, she came out and said, I think kids are actually held back by over-organized play. I think the fact that they don't make up their own rules and have to negotiate when, what happens when the goal, ball goes out of bounds, those are the very same skills that you use around the boardroom table or at work as an adult, but they're not developing those skills. When everything they do is re regulated by an adult who says when we start and when we finish and what the rules are and there's a whistle and you're only with kids of the same age and gender, same size, so there's none of the variability that being a free range kid induces. 
So I'm going to challenge us to think about this fundamental question, could we? at least conceptually, embrace the notion of restoring the opportunity for kids to be free-range kids again. Now, we can live in fear land. We can stay in fear land and just say, no, I'm not ready to do that. But I think there's a real high price for that. And I think it's well uh, illustrated by the chronic disease apocalypse that we're talking about. And here's the, the rant that I think you have to hear. Everybody wants to talk about this one. They want to talk about the obesity epidemic. Everybody catalogs the data that shows that now we're fully at one third of American adults with a body mass index that is over 30. That's the cutoff for obese by medical measure. And that it looks like that curve is continuing to rise. That there's no relenting in that. And that the media has jumped on that with titles like girth of a nation. And I think we are very wrong minded in talking about it that way. And I think it's well illustrated by this special issue of Time Magazine on a disease we used to call adult onset diabetes. Now, we can no longer call it adult onset. What's the clinical term? And why can't we call it adult onset diabetes anymore? Seen it in nine and 10 year olds, like the young lady pictured on the front of the magazine, right? And five page article devoted to this disease, the bulk of which looked at genetics, your genetic predisposition to diet, to drug research. A lot of it was about when are we gonna get the breakthrough drug that will cure type two diabetes. One half of one column on one page, so a tiny section devoted to the most important research in the field in the last maybe two decades, certainly the last 15 years, called the Diabetes Prevention Program, published in the New England Journal of Medicine as well as many other journals, in which they did a very interesting thing, long-term study that, that took people, 3,000 people from all over the United States of different ages and incomes and ethnic backgrounds and educational levels, with one thing in common, they were at risk for but had not yet developed type 2 diabetes. So they had an elevated fasting glucose but were not yet diagnostic. So they put them in one of three intervention groups. Now the first group got the standard counseling, the kind of stuff that many of you as health educators might be doing right now. Pamphlets and information and encouragement to do things like shopping and cooking classes so they learned how to purchase and prepare healthier foods and, um, and, and that kind of stuff. And they were given a pill. And those people, um, well, they had two groups actually. And half of them got a pill that ha was metformin, an actual diabetes medication, and half got a placebo, meaning the pill didn't do anything, right? And it's called a randomized control trial because even the researchers don't know which group you're in. You're just coded by number, and only at the end can they analyze the data. Now, to their credit, they not only had those two groups in the study, they had a third group. And those guys didn't get the standard counseling, pamphlets and information and encouragement, nor did they get a pill. But what they did get was put in an intensive lifestyle modification program, which included really active, engaged, like cooking and shopping classes, and at least 150 minutes a week of physical activity. So they set up walking groups and all this. And by the way, we're not talking training for a marathon. We're talking about 30 minutes a day, on average five days a week, brisk walking. Everybody got that? My question to you, which group of the three did best? Does anybody know who's read this research or is, is aware of the actual study? You've actually looked at this or you know about it. And which group did best? The third group, are you sure? Did they do a little bit better? They did a lot better? First of all, every hand in the room should be up and it will be in a moment because, and by the way, it's a good thing if it's the third group because why else am I talking about it, right? <laughs> Turns out the people in the uh, drug intervention actually saw a 30% reduction in risk of developing type two diabetes over the people in uh, uh, the placebo which is massive, by the way. In intervention trials, when you see a 30% shift, that's like a big deal. That would have been the huge news of this study. It would have been massive. And needless to say, the drug companies would have touted that as the big news, except for one thing. The people in the lifestyle intervention saw almost a 60% reduction in risk, almost twice the reduction in risk, 58% versus 31, which is mind blowing. Ne needless to say, you have to understand, that is so big that they stop the study early and put everybody in a lifestyle intervention program because it is considered morally unethical to have one treatment in a study like this that works so much better and not give it to everybody in the study. In drug cancer trials, if, if cancer drug trials, if one group is like 8% better, they stop the study and everybody gets that drug. 60% is mind blowing. And if you're curious, has he worked himself up to his rant yet? The answer is yes, because I think we gotta stop just talking about an obesity epidemic and talk about the two things upon which they intervened in this study, which are epidemics of inactivity and poor nutrition. Those are the drivers, and they are two thirds of the evil triad stool that I alluded, alluded to more before. And in fact, the three things that are driving healthcare costs through the roof, physical inactivity, poor nutrition, and tobacco use. And my last piece of the rant, if anybody, if anybody tries to engage you, oh, you're in healthcare, or you're in health promotion, 
do you believe, that, and they try to engage you in a debate on how we do healthcare in this country and whether we need a single payer system or whether we need an insurance private payer system or Obamacare or anything else, tell them to shut up because they're talking about the wrong thing. That debate, quite sincerely, is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as it steams full speed toward the iceberg until we deal with the root causes of chronic disease in our society. I am in no way exaggerating. Anytime I get the ear of a legislator, senator, I have this conversation with them. I say, you guys better deal with primary prevention or you're blowing smoke talking about health care reform in this country because the, we know what the dollar cost is going to continue to do with an aging population being overwhelmed by chronic diseases driven by the big three. Okay, everybody take a breath. <laughs> Calm down. I'm done with the rant. Are there any questions? Would anybody, thank you, would anybody like to debate me on the topic? <laughs> Good. I want you to be just as vehement anytime you talk to anybody about this. Who's with me on changing the conversation? It's not just an obesity epidemic. We're talking about twin epidemics of inactivity and poor nutrition and indeed a third of tobacco use that we have to address. Now, this is not a rhetorical question. Your hand has to go up if you're with me. <laughs> And, and by the way, this is not raising your hand, this is copping out. I want your elbow as high as your ear. Who's with me? It's the only thing I'm going to ask you to do, for God's sake. All right. Now, let me try this. Who is not? Who thinks the tactics we've been using are working well? Let's keep talking about the obesity epidemic. Raise your hand so that I can berate you publicly in front of the group. <laughs> Which is exactly what we do to severely overweight people in our society, don't we? We blame the individual, we make them feel horrible about themselves. It is completely the wrong way to handle this. I am sincerely certain of that. So I beg you, join me in, in this, if don't have to do anything else, this campaign to recalibrate the conversation. Because let's be clear, here's what the epidemiological studies tell us. Physical inactivity and poor nutrition are independent risk factors. If we can help somebody eat better and be more active, irrelevant of weight change, their risk profile changes. Does everybody want to, everybody agree with that? Everybody understands that. Independent risk factors, change them, we gain benefit. Great. Good. That's a pretty good starting point. We can calm down now. We don't have to rant. I probably will again before we're done, but at least for a little while I won't. And now I'm going to get to a really very practical question. How do you spend your time? If, that's, if you believe what we've just said so far, what should we put our effort into? And I'm going to actually tell you about five real things I was invited to do, and I'm going to describe them, and I want everybody in the room to vote for the one you think is most important, because these happen to be five invitations in the same week. I wasn't going to necessarily be able to do all of them. You have the same problem. There are constant demands on your time and resources. What do you spend your time on? So five things. One, America on the Move national campaign to get everybody to wear pedometers and increase their daily steps and improve their diets. They said, come speak at our national conference. Two, serve on my local planning board in the town of Situate, Massachusetts, about 30 miles south of Boston. We happen to have a planning board meeting that week, and among the many things we were going to talk about, new subdivisions and stuff, we were talking about possible acquisition of land for a trail. Three, um, the town of Belmont, near where I live, was having their community-wide health fair. The state legislator had seen me give legislative testimony. She invited me. She said, could you come to our health fair, lead a walk, set up a table with your books and DVDs, uh, give a big talk so everybody hears, kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Get people out, try it, let them see how easy it is to walk. Right? Make, it, make it real to them and help change their lives. Four, state of Massachusetts at the time was updating their highway design manual. It's the guidelines that the engineers use that tell you how wide lanes are and where you can put stuff and um, signs and things like that. And they said, would you come and address the team on bicycle and pedestrian accommodation? And five, there's a company promoting Nordic walking. Who's, anybody heard of Nordic walking? The idea of walking with ski poles, with, you know, basically hiking poles to burn more calories. And so their theory was this. Use the marketplace, man. We're a capitalist society. So what we're going to do is make a DVD of you talking about walking and health. We'll give it as a gift when people buy things. So you're helping us sell our polls. We're helping you get your message out. Pretty logical. And admittedly, five very different approaches. Agreed? Dramatically different. Marketplace, you know, manual, blah, blah, blah. Okay, everybody vote for one. How many say national campaign, Americans with pedometers? Everybody increasing their daily steps. Hands up for that. No? No? How about local planning board meeting on the acquisition of land? Okay, so I'm going to call that about 20. How many say local health fair? Change lives, hand-to-hand -hand combat. They walk, they realize how energizing it is, they come back excited. Good, excellent. That's about the same, maybe a little higher. Highway manual, how many people think that's? Okay, look around. These are the nerds in the room. Look at the nerds. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about curb radius. <laughs> that's, that's fun. <laughs> I'm an engineer by training. I went to MIT. I'm allowed to use that word and not be, it's not perjurative for me to say that. 
How about Nordic walking? Use the marketplace. Some people didn't vote. Thank you very much. Is you, you're the only person that cares whether the Fentons can pay the mortgage. This would be the only revenue, revenue generating activity on the list. Thanks. All right, so let's talk about these. By the way, just a quick survey sample. How many of you have actually used pedometers and tried to use pedometer health promotion programs? Oh, it's funny you didn't vote for that. And how many of you put on health fairs of some sort or another? Hands up, not a rhetorical question. This is not raising your hand. Let's try again. Who has done or been involved with a health fair? Very good. And how many of us have shown up at local planning board meetings on something that didn't affect my house or my neighborhood? Did not affect, so something other than my neighborhood. Wait a minute, let's try again. Not my house, not my neighborhood. So a community issue. All right, very good. And how many of you have weighed in on the state highway design manual in any way? Uh huh. Yeah, I thought so. So it's interesting how our votes and our behavior don't correlate quite as well, do they? Think about it. A lot of people voted for pedometers and, and, and health fairs. In fact, let's analyze these and let's start with the things you do, not what you voted for, because apparently there's a fundamental disconnect there. Health fair. A lot of us do those. I've been at millions in my lifetime, walking magazine. I used to do them all the time, get invited all the time. Now, there's a fundamental question, what do we talk about, what do we recommend, how much? I think it's actually a pretty easy answer. I think you talk about walking because it's an easy entry activity. I mean, tell people to do whatever they can, but if we can't get them to do anything else, they can walk. It doesn't cost anything, no special training required, and in fact, the national guidelines are very clear. If you can get that 30 minutes a day, it's why, by the way, 150 minutes a week was in the diabetes study, because that's been a standing recommendation that really started back in 1996 with the Surgeon General's report. And increasingly, we now recognize that activity can be broken up. So the person who is walking a child to or from school 15 minutes each way, this is over at Abe Wing Elementary, just down, down the road here in Glens Falls. Um, uh, even that person accumulating that activity sees the same benefit as far as reduced risk for uh, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis and its complications, a growing list of cancers. For example, we know from major epidemiological studies, not only are physically active women at lower risk for breast cancer, but among women diagnosed with breast cancer, you see a higher survival rate among those who are moderately physically active. So every time we get another major study, we see that has great benefit. And by the way, physical activity has great benefit. We, we also know um, that kids need more like an hour a day minimum. And in both cases, these are minimum recommendations. All of the research suggests more is better. In fact, as one of the researchers at Harvard once put it at a conference we were at, she said, look, some activity is better than none, more is better than some. So there's a dose response, we know that to be the case, but if at very least we want adults doing a half an hour a day, kids doing an hour. So I got a great story for the health fair. My question is, why didn't you vote for the health fair? You all had your hands up, I do them, I've done them. Why do we not vote for that when I gave you the choice? Not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you to tell me right now, why did you not vote for it? So she's saying the health fair gets people who are kind of already engaged. In fact, we use the term the worried well. The worried well. They're already actually thinking about it. Here's, and why else? Is there any other reasons? Oh, uncertain of the impact. In fact, let's be clear. There is no clinical evidence that a health fair actually leads to behavior change over time. So to recast those two, the people who are there are probably already pre-qualified and we have no strong clinical evidence that correlates attendance or walking away with the pamphlet or any of that stuff to actual behavior change. Which leads to me to my first of five recommendations, which is anything you are doing, put this first filter on it. Not how many people am I going to touch and how many people is this likely to actually change behavior. Not how many pamphlets can I count and say went away, how many t-shirts you know, left the room, and how many people is this activity, this enterprise likely to change behavior in the long run. That's question number one. That should be, if you don't remember anything else, these five questions will help you filter what you spend your time on, and that's number one. Which leads me to Nordic walking, which frankly has a very compelling story. They've done research, the Nordic countries have kind of launched it, they all ski in the winter, and then they actually do run and walk with their poles in the summer. So it's a good story, it's great for your upper body, blah, blah, blah. But I think it has a, a couple of, and I like it by the way, I use it to train, I trained for all of that 50 mile hike using these Nordic poles, and I hiked with them to help us reduce impact on our knees during the descents, all of that. But the real question is, will this get popular or would this just be another fitness fad, even if it did take off, you know, popular for a while. And more importantly, let's be honest, what about the dork factor? Come on, I mean, it is sort of goofy looking, you know. I've had people when I'm out in my poles go, hey dude, like where's the snow, man? You don't have any skis on, what are you doing? And it's a fair question. Interestingly enough, I don't think the dork factor is what's gonna do it in, I think it's the stickiness problem. Um, 
But, but to note the dork factor, right? the reason I can tell you, I, I'm pretty sure that I have done the dorkiest of all sports in history. If you've heard me speak before, you've heard me make this admission. I've kind of come out of the closet as, uh, and I'm now open about the fact that, yes, I used to be, of all bizarre things, a competitive race walker. And I don't know if you know race walking is a real event in the Olympics. They used to have it in the Empire State Games. If, do they still have the Empire State Games? I actually meddled in the Empire Games when I was growing up in Brockport, New York. Um, you can tell it was a very long time ago that I used to race walk as evidenced by the fact that we only had black and white photography back then. <laughs> and the other giveaway is those shorts were actually in style when I was competing. <laughs> back in, this is the 1928 National Championships. And um, many people will ask, why did you choose to be a race walker of all the goofy sports you might have chosen? And the answer is obvious when I show you the next slide. Well, of course, it's the huge crowds that showed up at our competition. <laughs> This being, not kidding now, the start of the 1984 Olympic trials in the 50 kilometer race walk. 50 kilometers is 31 miles, so it's actually five miles longer than the marathon. The 84 Olympics, you may recall, was held in Los Angeles. That's the Los Angeles Coliseum, LA Coliseum, where they held the Olympic tryouts and where they started us at six in the morning to avoid the heat of the day. Like they do with the marathon, you start on the track, then you go through a tunnel out into the city and you do your loop, then you come back in to finish. And when we finished at 10 in the morning, the stadium was packed because the real events were going on, like the mile and the shot put. But at six in the morning when they started us to avoid the heat, you have to look very closely to see my mom and dad right over there. <laughs> That's really them. I'm not, that's not digitally altered. That's, from Brockport, New York to Los Angeles, they came out to see me compete. Uh, and, it, you know, and my mom would be like, way to go, sweetheart, looking good. J just 30 miles to go, honey. Thanks, mom. Yeah. So anyhow, I, I, I know a lot about dorky sports, and I don't think that's what's going to I mean, people got, people go, gorgeous day outside, they go to a, a room and get on a stationary bicycle with 10 other people and drip sweat on one another while somebody screams instructions and that, okay, fast, now slow, now, now up, now down, all that stuff. And you know, they can, it's gorgeous out, right? You're at the foothills of the Adirondacks and they're in a room. And I'm not knocking it. I hope you do spinning. It's great, but <laughs> it's no more, less dorky than this, that, that concept. <laughs> That's not going to be the problem with, um, with, Nordic, with the Nordic walking. The problem is going to be the stickiness problem. So let's talk a little public health data. Here's a very simple intervention study that tried to get people to walk 40 minutes a day. A guy named John Jakisic did it. He's a pretty good friend. He's now at University of Pittsburgh's Medical Center. And, and they had three groups in the study. One group was told, walk your 40 minutes all at once. Go out and find a time to do it. Second group was told, you can break it into four 10-minute walks when it's convenient. And the third group was told, not only can you break it into four 10-minute walks, but um, we're going to put a treadmill in your house. Got it? So that's what SBT stands for, short bouts with treadmill. And then they did all the things that the research suggests will get people to exercise more. So they um, called them on the phone with email and, and sent emails to remind them. They uh, taught them how to warm up beforehand and how to stretch afterwards and how to pick a good walking shoe so they don't get injuries. Uh, they gave them an exercise log and a diary. And if you filled it in um, and then turned it in, you got a prize, like a t-shirt or water bottle. And not unlike nutrition studies that have done the similar things, you, you can shift behavior. If this was five a day fruit and vegetable consumption, and you had you know, a food diary, same effect, right? They all three groups increased their exercise minutes per week, which is frankly, from a public health standpoint, not the interesting question. The interesting question is, after the six-month intervention period, what actually happened? Did they continue to increase the activity? Did they at least maintain it, or did it drop off? And I'm going to ask you all to vote for one of those three arrows, but before you do, I'm going to give you inside information, which is that at six months, they had been walking enough to have shown statistically significant reductions in weight and increases in aerobic fitness. So to say, again, they objectively measured weight and fitness, after six months of moderate daily walking, people were losing weight and getting more fit. Got it? So based on that, everybody in the room has to vote for one of the three trend arrows, which is the trend for the total group. How many believe they continue to increase their physical activity? Hands up for that. How many, okay, thank you for your optimism. How many believe they at least maintained their physical activity? Six months was long enough to create the positive biofeedback loop, that's the theory, and they maintain. And real hand waves, not, th not this, this, good. And how many believe it dropped off? And you would be all the health educators in the room, right? <laughs> Who do this work all the time and know that that's precisely what happens. It's very distressing, but anybody who does this work will tell you, they say, you know, I'll be able to tell you about the one or two anecdotal successes. The guy who lost 70 pounds and is off his, off his cholesterol meds now and stuff like that. But for the most part, we know people tend to regress back to the initial condition, particularly when it's just a behavior change program. This is what I call the stickiness problem. The problem is not in creating the short-term acute change 
short-term increase in fruit and vegetable consumption, short-term increase in activity. It's getting it to stick. I could show you similar graphics in the nutrition field, same shape curve with the stickiness problem. By the way, if this, there's not many in the physical activity field because most of these studies end at six months and we declare victory, not recognizing what the long-term effect was. Notably, there are lots of weight loss studies which generally include a physical activity and a nutrition component. They are all shaped like this. This one compares being on a self-help program, the red line to wet, yellow, being in Weight Watchers. But in both cases, you see early success followed by weight regain. And again, anybody who works in weight loss programming, I'm sure would confirm this and say, yeah, for the most part, if you're doing a behavior change program, I can tell you about anecdotal successes, but at population level, we have not cracked the code. Okay? Is everybody okay with this? Does anybody want to contest this? Great. I mean, you can tell me your anecdotal success. That's not what I'm looking for. I want to tell me about the study where three years later we know people have successfully. Now, what's the result? When I look at attainment of that 30 minute per day, five day a week, or 150 minute per week recommendation through what we call leisure time physical activity, LTPA, you'll notice the yellow line here represents those who attain it. It is not only stuck at about 20%, it has been there of the, of the US adult population, it has been there for 20 years. So guys like me have been running around flapping our lips doing TV shows and books and magazines and videos to no avail. No avail. We're still as inactive as we ever have been. We're barely holding the line. By the way, the researchers who do this research, this is based on what's called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It's a national sample telephone survey. It strongly overestimates the number of people attaining the 30 minutes per day because people tend to tell you what they want to hear on a telephone survey. When they've done validation studies, actual objective measurement of physical activity, the number's much closer to 10 to 15%, probably half of that figure. Same, by the way, with BMI. People tend to tell you they are taller and they weigh less when you're talking to them on the phone than when you're measuring them in real life. So this is very grim news. And it means that maybe, just maybe, we ought to stop talking about leisure time, physical activity, or exercise. Consciously going out and carving out time to go to the gym, to work out, to train for a marathon. Maybe we need to take another approach, which is in fact philosophically what has happened in the movement at the national level. Centers for Disease Control, all their funding is now directed much more toward what we call lifestyle-based physical activity. Physical activity is a part of daily living. So, good, good con concept. And by the way, the nutritional corollary, we are not trying to get people on diets. We're trying to get them to eat healthfully as a way of life, right? Because we know how long a diet lasts until I get to my target weight and time for my class reunion and then I go right back to what I was doing before. So so it's about lifestyle-based change in physical activity and nutrition. And I don't think, I mean, I'm sure this is, jives with all of your heads. If you've worked in this field, you're here. So that's actually what America on the Move is very fundamentally about. And I've even written a book called Pedometer Walking because I do believe pedometers can be a good motivational tool for the front end of the stickiness thing, the getting people to change acutely. Um, but the interesting question is, do they work as far as long-term lifestyle change? Now. Um, uh, they, they have done interesting studies on this. And when we tell people, by the way, you can be physically active as a part of daily life, what are the kinds of recommendations we give? We don't say you have to go to the gym. How else can you add steps to your day, for example? Park farther away. Stairs instead of the elevator. Was anybody staying in the hotel here? Did anybody stay here last night? Did you find the stairs? They're actually not locked doors and they don't set off fire alarms. It was delightful. I could, you know how many hotels, you, you know, you, the, the, door, the door says, don't go through it because it'll set off an alarm. It was, it was lovely. But in general, is your observation people are taking the stairs instead of the elevator? Just as you look at daily life, are they doing it? I'm in McCarran Airport recently, in fact, on the way to and from Zion National Park. You have to get from where the little train is up to the concourses, but one of the escalators will broke, was broken. So you'll notice there's one working escalator and then next to it a stairway, and you'll see that people are literally queuing up, <laughs> queuing up to take the one working escalator rather than walking 10 steps out of their way to go up the stairs. And to be crystal clear, I am not making fun of those people. I want to be very clear. I suggest to you, we have so engineered physical activity out of our daily lives, they don't even see the stairs as an opportunity, right? They just don't connect with it. I only saw two kind of nerdy guys take the stairs while I was there, that guy and me. And we're the two guys that carry our luggage as a backpack, not a rolly bag, which is frankly a kind of a pain to pull up steps. We have gone so far as to engineer, we try to reduce caloric expenditure from rolly bags to garage door openers to clickers for our televisions, right? I mean, think about it, sit down lawnmowers. Uh, all of that is about reduction in caloric expenditure in the end. Um, and, and that's the result. So I'm thinking that, and by the way, when the Cooper Clinic did a study of lifestyle versus structured exercise, two notable things from their graphic, this is energy expended per week in the study, what you'll notice is over the six month intervention period, both groups increased their, their, their physical activity, all right, including the people that went to the gym and the people that got pedometers and were told build it into daily life. 
And both groups suffered the stickiness problem after the six-month intervention was over. No more reminders, no more t-shirts and water bottles. Notable is the fact that lifestyle intervention shows as much promise, right? As far as, so it, 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 but it also has the same challenge. So I think that's a good starting point for the conversation. And I do have an answer, and I'm looking for a community. I have been soliciting a community to do the PAPI program. I keep thinking that Jess is going to let me help me do it up in Elizabethtown, up in Essex County, because I, I, if we can find some funding, but if anybody else is interested, let me know. It's called PAPI. That's an acronym, and it stands for, um, they'll, someday they're going to call this the Fenton PAPI program. I'm going to be famous for this. It stands for Physical Activity Promotion Through Predator Introduction. And <laughs> what, it's good, right? You're thinking that's right on target. Because I'm thinking, you're going to come into the meeting today, and it's going to be like this at the registration table. You're going to be, uh, I got to tell you, uh, that mountain line that they released over on Ridge Street, uh, that thing is fast. <laughs> Woo, got a little stitch. Yeah. And indeed, I presented this to the Centers for Disease Control. All kidding aside, really serious conference. I threw this in. And one of the docs goes, Fenton, that's kind of interesting, because uh, there's sort of a, a Darwinian element to it. <laughs> I said, that's right, because after all, you don't have to be able to run faster than the bear, just the guy you're with. <laughs> Think about it. You knew that was coming, right? Um, OK, so given that I'm not going to get any funding for that, apparently, the CDC said no. We may run a pilot program anyway, but we haven't figured it out yet. I guess we're going to have to go with what the research says. And the research says if you really want population level behavior change, I hope you've all heard this before, you need to take what's called a socio-ecological approach. Social ecology says don't just tell the individual what to do. Have all the other cues in their life, from family and friends to workplace, the healthcare provider, to the community by its very design and policies. All of them sort of encourage that. And you guys can tell me, in as much as the evil triad, we have made some progress on one of the three, what has it been, right? What have we had that success in? tobacco by using this approach, right? We don't just say, don't smoke, it's bad for you. We do a lot of that, but we also tax the daylights out of the product. There's a warning label on the side that says, this will kill you. Your kids get it at school and come home and say, why are you smoking, daddy? It's going to kill you and kill me. Can't do it in public places. We're continuing to work. We were talking about the great work you guys are doing. You're targeting now even open space in outdoor public place bans. The park across the street, no smoking sign right there on the corner. We're really making progress. And if you look at per capita cigarette consumption, and nobody would assert the battle is over. Understand, I get that. But when you look at per capita cigarette consumption in this country, the downward trend occurred not way back here when we realized cigarettes kill us, but way out here when we started policy level intervention. When we started community level, policy level intervention, not just focusing on the individual. To which you should be, if you're with me now, saying, OK, Mark, so what's the analogy around physical activity and nutrition? How do we get the other two legs of the deadly stool to be changed? And for many, there seems to be this intuitive grasp of what we need to do around nutrition. I'm not saying they've really got it, because many people say, OK, I get vending machines out of the school. I get that if I'm in a workplace and I put out a healthy you know, basket of fruit rather than a basket of Danish, if I put out a healthy breakfast with yogurt, I mean with uh, oatmeal and fruit, and, you know, people will consume that, right? That's an environmental change. If we put out healthy food, that environment is different. But that's not sufficient. Less fast food, more farmer's market. Those who work in nutrition will tell us we really have to think about entire food systems from farm to table, how it's created, how we deliver it, how, you know, and how we get it into people's, uh, into people's hands. Similarly, with regard to physical activity, which is really my more, expertise, more my expertise, many people say, do you mean we need to put a gym in every workplace in America and a treadmill in every house? Well, wait a minute. I showed you the treadmill in the house study. And it had the stickiness problem. That's clearly not enough. We need to take a much more dramatic approach, which I think is illustrated by this question. Imagine if every time you walked out your front door, if your destination was close enough, it was within a close enough distance you could walk. And then if the distance was greater, it would be reasonable to ride a bike. That, you know, there would be bike trails and a place to park it when you get to the other end and you wouldn't feel like you're taking your life into your hands. And if you had to go further still, if there's enough population density to support it, there would be transit. And by the way, transit means everything from the kind of fixed bus system they have here in town to dial a bus, senior shuttle, paratransit that you might have in smaller, more rural communities. And only as a last resort would you have to get in a car. I'm imagining that place. My question to you is, that's a nice imaginary schematic diagram. Has anybody traveled anywhere in the world where you think, yeah, I actually believe people live that way? Where? America. South America. A lot of South American cities have actually made conscious decisions. Spain. Sure. Barcelona you've been to? Madrid. Yeah, Madrid, very much, yeah. Prague. Yeah, the Czech Republic. In fact, there are people going on bike tours to Prague now because it is such a bike-friendly city. You went back? 
Yeah, okay, good, excellent, right? And a great train system so you can land in Geneva and never get in a car, right? Use trains and buses to connect and then walk in the towns and the hills. Mind-blowing, isn't it? Okay, come to the United States for me. And by the way, people will regularly say Amsterdam and places like that. But here's the problem, Amsterdam. People say, you know, they don't have very, very severe uh, bad weather in the Netherlands. They don't have severe winters. And you know, it's really flat. So um, tell me if somewhere, anybody had experiences in the United States that flies in the face of that? Ottawa, Canada, very cold, and a lot of bicycling up there. Excellent example. Go. Absolutely New York, for sure. 40% of people in Manhattan don't own a car, right? I mean, it's stupid to drive there. Or Boston, where I live. Boston, yeah, Cambridge. yeah, Cambridge. Cambridge has done amazing stuff. Boulder. Boulder, lots of hills there, by the way. Or let's go to Portland, Oregon, very hilly. Or go to Minneapolis, Minnesota, harsh winters. In fact, Minneapolis and Portland have some of the highest bicycle and pedestrian rates in the country. You're going to say big cities, I'm in a small town. Well, I can go to small town America, go across the Champlain over to Burlington and look at the bike trail network and look at the university students crazily riding their bikes even through the winter, right? Okay, so my point is, yes, I think we can say these places are not just theoretical, they exist. Now the question is, what does it take to get there? And um, I would further go so far as to say, we have to rethink then how we're going to talk about physical activity and that top picture is fine for some but it's probably going to serve 10, 12, 15% of the population. For the other 85%, we've got to start building a world where it's easy to just make that decision. Walk to the corner store, walk my kid to school, ride my bike. At least that's an option and in fact, increasingly, it's a better option. Increasingly, what we want it to be is safer, cheaper, less costly to take the healthy alternative. I don't want the apple to cost more than the apple fruit pie. I would like the apple to cost less than the fruit hostess fruit pie with apples in it. Agreed? I mean, you know, and I, I don't want walking to be more of a hardship. Hard to find a place to park my bike. I would like it to be easy. So that leads me to the planning board, for which a good number of you voted, and I concur, fairly important, because that's where a lot of on-the-ground decisions are made. Do we have the sidewalks? Does the sidewalk end? Do we build the sidewalk from nowhere to nowhere? And let me be clear about this. That's Brockport, New York, my hometown, where their ordinance requires that if you redevelop a parcel for commercial use, like the Aldi grocery there, you have to do the sidewalk. Guaranteed, the developer asked for a waiver. They said, look, no sidewalk on either side. Why should we have to do it? It's an additional hardship. We have to pass the cost on to the tenant, which is the grocery store. And to their credit, the planning board said, no, part of our ordinance, and it's part of our long-term plan to have sidewalks throughout the community, so you've got to build the sidewalk. So when the parcel next to you develops, we can connect. And it will not be to your detriment, but indeed to your benefit, because because when the 14-year-old kid who wants to come bag groceries here and can't drive yet, or the elderly person wants to come and shop here who can't drive anymore, they'll actually be viable for them to walk. And it would have been a lot easier, as a guy who serves on a local planning board, trust me on this, for them to make that decision as a board if who had been in the room. Because normally who's in the room is the developer and his lawyer and his engineer, and they're asking for the waiver, and they ask for it, and there's the public testimony period, and nobody speaks up. And so they say, okay, grant the waiver, no sidewalk. What could change that dynamic? Citizens. Yeah, citizens, users, or more specifically, us, right? All of you. Were you to show up and say, I am actually with a health coalition from the community. I work with uh, the local hospital. I'm a health educator. And let me just tell you this. I, I would like to testify in support of the board having this ordinance and, in fact, requiring it so that over the long term we can help fight the nation's epidemic of physical inactivity and poor nutrition, right? Because we know if we can get people to walk just a little bit more, we can change health profiles. That's how the conversation goes, you guys. By the way, as a local board member, trust me on this, we love to have rational people come in and testify because most of the time it's completely fanatic, froth at the mouth, nut jobs. <laughs> You've heard of the NIMBYs, right? The people who say, not in my backyard. Well, the ones I've learned about on my, that come to our board meetings are the cave people. They are the citizens against virtually everything. They just show up to yell. Blah, 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 blah. They want to get on local access TV. That's all they're looking for. So you should say to me, Mark, is there any data? Is there any evidence that we can build places? If we build it, will they come, basically? And the short answer is yes. It boils down to basically these four things. These, in fact, are the four questions that I use to filter every decision I make on my board and that I believe each of us should use to filter our work. Am I creating a greater variety of destinations within walk, bike, and transit distance? Are they well connected by things like sidewalks and trails and bike lanes? Is it inviting when I show up at my destination to be there on foot, on bike, in transit? And last but not least, is it safe and accessible for all ages, all abilities, all income levels? And let me just repeat, there are studies that validate each of these or some combination of those, which I'll talk 
talk about very briefly here. For example, a lot of uh, photos, in fact, many from up in Elizabethtown and Essex County from the workshop last year, hence the snow. Um, land use, what we're really talking about is building places where um, you know, neighborhoods are compact, like the more traditional downtowns, shared open space like public parks, post offices and grocery stores nearby, multi-use, meaning even retail on the first floor, housing above, which even in the smallest towns, main streets historically had. Frequently, the business owner lived right above his own store, so you had a myth. I, I take these photos from my work around the country where um, I met these little boys coming out of a church, actually, in a neighborhood where new sidewalks had put in, and I, there was some subsidized housing, and I said to the guys, how do you like the neighborhood, the new sidewalks, there's a little park? They say, it's great. They say, we're really psyched because the pastor opened a little, uh, uh, um, like a, a neighborhood store, a corner store in the church behind them. That blue building's a church. And they were coming out and they had snacks in their hands. So I asked, where are you coming from? And they say, yeah, he opened a store. And they said, it's great. And I said, how come? They say, well, it's really not a neighborhood if it doesn't have a corner store. Now, interestingly enough, these kids, I guarantee you, have never taken a course in urban planning at age 13, yet they know the mix of uses, having neighborhood and a recreational area, the park and the church and a little corner store stuck in the back. Made it Now, I would love to partner with that reverend and say, hey, could we make sure some of the snacks are healthy, or maybe all of them, so let's not do chips and soda. Could we come up with some dollars so you'd have some chillers, so you could have some fruit for the kids? Because now we can connect both the physical activity and the nutrition. The kids have a place to walk, and it's a place where they get a healthy snack. That's how we have to start thinking about this stuff. But, or we could look at this business, a small business in Madison, Wisconsin, where the business owner in an otherwise residential neighborhood had painted on his thing, on the building, hey, please drive slowly on this street. Most of our customers come on feet. <laughs> Pretty clever, right? He's saying, I know I'm a neighborhood store. He's thinking about it from a business perspective, but I like it from a public health perspective. Furthermore, when the town had a buy a bike rack program, if you as a store owner pay for the bike racks, we as a city will install them. He said, yeah, I'll take two. It's a great public-private partnership, and I think it's something that you should all be replicating everywhere. Bike racks are an easy way to change the dynamic, and it doesn't have to cost the city a lot. If all you do is installation, buy them at wholesale. They're reasonably cheap. Businesses institutions, organizations, the Rotary can sponsor a couple, you know, and put them in front of the library. You know, there are those kinds of opportunities. Second is the network. You need the facilities to connect the different destinations. Sidewalks, multi-use trails, bike lanes, and transit. And yes, I know some of your com smaller communities are going to say, Mark, we don't have a transit system like here, like buses here in uh, Glens Falls. I get that. But maybe you have a pair of transit dial -a bus. There is research that tells us regular transit riders get more physical activity which should not be striking. If you think about it, the act of walking to or from the bus stop at either end of the trip adds statistically significant number of minutes separate from any other activity that a person does as part of their daily commute or travel. Um, I love the fact that the system in town here has bike racks on the front. I actually chatted with a bus driver over there at the stop right across the street this morning when I'm right across from City Hall. I said, so do the bike racks actually get used? She goes, oh, you wouldn't believe. All year round and, you know, lots and all year round. And I said, mostly students. She goes, no, no, a lot of our regular riders. You know, we got people who don't have cars, people who can't drive. She said, they're using them right through the winter. In fact, the bike racks are critical to people who want to ride weather changes in the middle of the day so they can ride home on the bus, throw the bike on the front. Um, we know that bikes do not have to always have striped bicycle lanes. We can use things called sharrows, shared use arrows. They can ride on street when the traffic and volume is low enough. We can have segregated multi-use trails. I show you that not very glamorous section of the American River Trail in Sacramento, California. It's underneath the elevated express. You'd say, kind of gross, why don't you show me a pretty trail? Because that's the most important two miles of the trail. It's the most two important two miles because it's the part that connects the innermost suburbs to downtown. And it's the part that's not just for recreational riding which gets a handful of people. It's for the everyday user, like that guy commuting to work who takes one car off of that highway, one less car we have to park downtown, reduces his greenhouse gas emissions, and is more likely, because he's doing it every day, to actually get 150 minutes a week, not just 20 or 30 minutes because he rides on Saturday morning. Dramatically different. In fact, a study by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that looked at what are the most used sections of trail. If you're somebody where you yourself or your community is working on trail development, I urge you, I beg you to use these criteria as you prioritize what you're working on. Number one, have the trail connect to the other parts of the system, sidewalks, bike lanes, on-street facilities. Number two, Get to destinations on the trail. A 20-mile trail in the middle of nowhere is just not going to see. I mean, it'll be gorgeous, and Mr. Hardcore Serious Cyclist will use it, but that's not who we're trying to get to. I want my mom to be able to ride to the pharmacy I want, or walk to the pharmacy. I want my kids to ride their bikes to school. So get to destinations. And number three, think of the trail as actually an integral part of the community, not an escape from it. In fact, in the study, they use the term social venues. Trails as a place for people to collect and interact. In Rapid City, South Dakota, the trail is so important, a 
by, um, I'm sorry, uh, a commuter route for kids going to school, it is one of their priority snow clearing routes. Let me say it again. It is one of the first things plowed when they have new snow in Rapid City, South Dakota, because they know so many kids will walk and bike to school on it that if they don't plow it, you ready for this? Those kids will actually either be walking in the street or ask mom for a ride, and that makes it much harder for them to plow. They have all those parents driving those kids to school. So they clear that to keep road, to the traffic's clear so they can do their road plowing. So you've got the Parks Department and the Public Works Department working together on that. These are the ways we have to have these conversations. Third, when I get to my destination, it's got to be appealing. My mother-in-law would walk to the local pharmacy in our little neighborhood in Situate, Massachusetts. She would never walk to the grocery store. The pharmacy was a classic storefront. The grocery store was set up like that, just behind a parking lot. That subtle difference, suburban style design, top right, versus in town design, village design, lower left, or what we would call traditional neighborhood design, was enough to deter her from walking. She would drive to the grocery. I suggest to you there is data that tells us bringing the building to the street, putting the parking behind, street trees, awnings, benches, all those things that we sometimes think of as aesthetics are anything but. In fact, those street trees might provide the shade so she's cool in the summer. The bench might give her a place to stop when she's halfway there. So think about all your potential users, not just the young and able-bodied. Um, this, this bicycle parking in front of the Austin, Minnesota a library, public library, there's a little sign here that says, hey, if you need a bike, rack, a bike lock, you can borrow one inside. So they not only lend bikes, books, they lend bike locks. The theory is they know a lot of kids come to the library, many come without their locks. They don't want to deter them from riding their bikes. So they provide great parking right in front of the door where it's very visible and secure and a bike lock. And yes, cold weather environments, I know upstate New York has lots of cold weather and a lot of snow in the winter. Anchorage, Alaska, we see people biking through the winter. And the one thing I would say is we have to work more toward having our bicycle parking covered. Pull it under the eaves of the building as they were going to do here after we observed this in our workshop there. Last but not least, it's got to be safe. So I can have all that other stuff there, but for the mom who's concerned about the well-being of her kid, what do I do about getting across that busy street? Well, we know there are designs, and traffic engineers, amazingly, are really our allies. As, as my inner engineer, I've got to defend my colleagues. If we ask them to build places where pedestrians and bicyclists and motor vehicles and transit can coexist, they can do it. If we ask them to build places where we just move more car faster, which is what we asked for for the last 50 years, they can do that too. We've got to stop asking just for the cars. We've got to ask for people, too, and they can give it to us. So these kinds of design attributes are available. Let me conclude by I don't want in any way to sound like I think it's only about physical activity, not nutrition. I don't focus on the nutrition piece. That's not my expertise. But increasingly, I am now working with nutritionists in teams because we're finding many of the things we want to talk about go hand in hand. So for example, when I'm doing zoning around more mixed use, I want more walkable neighborhoods, we also want to make sure we're zoning in space for community gardens, where we're going to have our farmer's market, uh, a lot, making sure the zoning ordinance allows for urban agriculture, that is in-town agriculture. Um, and we may even want to do wild stuff like zone where we allow fast food. Or, like Los Angeles County, true story here, they have in place a moratorium on the development of any fast food right now. They are studying where the fast food tends to be built and how it preferentially, adversely affects low-income communities because that tends to be where you see a lot of the fast food places. So they've been able to justify and had no legal challenge to the notion of no Chick-fil-A's, no McDonald's, none of that, no Taco Bell's not being built in LA County while they try to figure this thing out. By the way, studies like this one have helped bear it out. When they looked at obesity risk in communities, uh, urban settings, that, and that means just in town, not only big cities, what they found was being in a high fast food density neighborhood increased your risk of, uh, of obesity from anywhere from 12 to 14 pounds of overweight just by virtue of being in an environment. If you don't own a car, by the way, notice that it's even worse because you can't escape that environment. It's your only food choice. Can you picture this? Think about the lowest income neighborhoods in some of our communities. Those are the ones where the only choice is a mini mart and a couple of fast food joints. There's nothing but processed high fat, high sugar food, uh, high salt food there, right? So is this surprising? In fact, the researchers use the term obesogenic environment. Obesogenic environment to describe that. OK, so to recap, as I serve on a planning board, I'm going to think about all of these things, these elements, that the research tells me. And if you're looking for where are the research studies that summarize this kind of stuff, activelivingresearch.org, maintained by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation at San Diego State, phenomenal resource. You need to make the case to a city council, to a public works director. You can download the kinds of studies that, because we really have to have those kinds of conversations. Now you say to me, Mark, 
that's all great for the bigger cities, but I am in one of the most rural counties in the state of New York. You grew up in Brockport. You know what a small town in America, and, and, and how about a town with only 2,000 people? How about a town with 250 people? Well, let me just note this. I think that rather than being the places we ignore, they're the most important places. They are, in fact, the battleground because we know what our population in this country is doing. As our rural population is plummeting, it is not our urban population that's growing. It's our suburban population. And the reason we see that, what's really happening is the suburbs are essentially oozing out of our cities and towns. We're building subdivisions right up hillsides and so on. We're turning this, the lower left picture, into this at a phenomenal rate. And we're abandoning our downtowns, or at least we were for the last 30 years, as we built yet another strip mall, yet another big box, whether it was a Dollar General or a Walmart. And we're just sucking the economic life out of the downtowns. I think this is the battleground. I think small town America is exactly where we want to get ahead of this, do actually proactive planning, to restore the kinds of environments that are healthier and not just physically healthier, but economically healthier too. So, time to change the conversation and I am commissioning you guys to be partners in that change because frankly, you bring the mantle of public health to the conversation in a way that somebody else might be seen as being pro or anti-development or having a political agenda. Our only agenda, healthier population. Hard to argue with that. And by the way, when we make the case, we do have to talk the language of the person we're talking to. So we start from our health initiative, but we might want to talk about environmental benefits when we're out reaching out to environmentalists to join us. The public safety folks who want to reduce pedestrian collisions. We may want to talk when we talk to the schools about reducing the amount of money we're spending on busing kids, even the kids that live only a half mile from the school. Yeah, I know it's a rural district and some kids come from far away, but what about the kids that live within a half mile of the school and we're busing them too because we have to cru they have to cross Route 7 and it's too dangerous. So rather than fixing the crossing, we pay 70 grand a year for a bus to run a route there. So we're having schools be really, really good partners on this. Or when we go to make the case to city council, let's make the economic argument. All right, because when we're talking to city council, they may want to hear, what's my return on investment? Well, let's talk about housing values. Let's talk about the fact that during the recent boom in foreclosures, the most walkable communities were the ones that saw the lowest rates of foreclosures on homes. Housing values were highest. When the, National Association of Realtors writes on this topic and asks the question last summer, what is the next generation of home buyers wanting to buy? Or we could talk about the fact that the developers along the Erie Canal towpath trail now sell that. That's a real estate sign along the trail in Spencerport, New York, and it says the woods on canal path. That's different. They don't say sunken, uh, sunken living room, two fireplaces, jacuzzi baths. The one thing they decide to pitch on the sign out on the road is, yeah, these, this neighborhood abuts to the canal path. You're going to be able to walk out your back door and get on the trail. We've actually seen studies that show higher housing values and higher turn, quicker turnover. That is less time on the market proximate to facilities like that. Last but not least, go ahead and get a picture of that semi-vacant, low-vacancy mall or the one that has the high turnover in your community or nearby. We all thought that those were going to be the answer, those strip malls and boxes. From an economic standpoint, we are now changing the conversation. So when I go to talk to city councilors, I may shorten up the public health part of the conversation to this and talk all about economics and say, yeah, so how's that empty IGA or, or more likely Kmart or whatever out on the edge of town doing for you? Why aren't we reinvesting in our economic core, the downtown? Which, by the way, from my perspective is the most walkable, but from your perspective is also going to be the economically most healthy. This conversation is hot right now. Lots of communities are moving back to that. Okay, take a breath. That's a lot of content. So we're going to take a two-second break right now, and here's what I want everybody to do. Don't do it yet. I'm going to stand up, push your chairs in, and take one clockwise lap around your table and say hello to somebody new. Go for it right now. Chairs in. <laughs> one clockwise lap. So are we over an hour? Did you lose some yeah, at the end? 63 minutes. No, I, I lost like... Ten you seconds. lost three. Oh, okay. I lost like maybe one sentence and it won't problem at all. You had 60 minutes, right? 63. All right, when you get back to your table, when you get back to your chair, reach for the sky, change the light bulb. With both hands. Reach high. Up on your, up on your toes. Really reach high. It's a very tall light bulb. Reach really high. Change that light bulb. Very nice. Now shake those arms out. Relax, have a seat. Very good, thank you for doing that. I know you want to do a lot more. In my breakout session, you can go for a walk with me then. Then we'll go for a real walk. That's just to get the blood flowing. Your heinies have been sitting for a long time. They needed to, we needed to get that pooling blood moving again. All right, so home stretch. We're on my last of my five choices. Remember the highway manual that some of you voted for? Remember the nerds in the room that said, yeah, go to the highway talk. 
Do you remember that? Do you guys remember? It was like two days ago that we started this conversation. So what I did was I prepared this really fancy presentation with like digital images and I talked, this is a very common collision, four lane road where the left turning vehicle stops suddenly and then the car behind them either hits them or tries to dodge around them into the right lane. And I wanted to get the engineers to nod their heads and say, yeah, we can do this. And in fact, I talked about the fact that we're doing around the country what are called lane realignments, or you may have heard the term road diets. Has anybody seen or aware of a road diet in their community? Where a four lane road like this is reconfigured to have three lanes, one in each direction with a center turning lane. And what happens is you can actually reduce the collisions and maintain the flow because now the turning vehicles are moved out of the travel lanes. Um, and you get room for bike lanes and a possible even pedestrian crossing island uh, way up there at the top. Uh, and, and those are nice, and the engineers were nodding their heads. And that's, a, by the way, an actual project on the same road in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, where they've seen lower collisions, uh, lower severity of collisions, and um, same, maintain the same flow. So you know they're doing pre and post studies on these and finding these things can actually work in lots of different applications. In fact, when we were doing workshops over on the other side of Anna Rocks, Lowville, we actually looked at Main Street, which has this four lane configuration. And a lot of our downtowns, we get this. If it's a state route that's Main Street, you get this. It goes out to four lanes, presumably to allow for the turning movements, but it actually gets pretty hairy. And so we talked about the fact that sometimes it's only about striping. It's not about a major reconfiguration where you define a, a parking lane, a bicycle lane, and then a travel lane in each direction with a center turn lane. And I wasn't telling them you should necessarily do this here. What I wanted to show them is that it's more of a geometric change than anything that can sometimes work very, very well. So that's, um, uh, that was very interesting. But I got to tell you, the engineers didn't even quibble with me. They said, yeah, we're seeing this. We see the data on this all over the country. Many of us are ready. And they've made that part of the standard in the Massachusetts DOT guidelines. Um, they were much more intrigued by this. I did the number, of, the story of four, where I put up the number four and I added zeros to it. And I said, what do we kill about 4,000 of every year in this country? And they said, well, we kill about 4,000 pedestrians. The safety person in the room who's on this committee say at least 4,000 pedestrians in some years it's more. So that's right. And then I'm going to add another zero. And then they said, everybody who works in traffic safety knows this. We kill at least 40,000 in motor vehicle collisions in this country every year. Normally, the pedestrian component is 10 to 12 percent. Then I added one more zero. And they weren't quite sure, except for the one public health person who was on the team. And she said, would that be the number that died due to the obesity? And then she corrected herself. I mean, the epidemics of inactivity and poor nutrition. And I said, that's exactly right. It's actually about 365,000. But it's an order of magnitude greater. The engineers were blown away. So they said, so the case to do this is not just to save 4,000 pedestrian deaths or reduce 40,000 motor vehicle deaths. But indeed, if we can build these places so people actually can walk and bicycle, we're talking about massive potential savings in healthcare costs and quality of life and early death. And it was really compelling because I submit to you that most traffic engineers, transportation planners, highway superintendents are well-intentioned people that want to serve their community well. They're in a public service position. They've just not made this connection and they're squashed by tightened budgets and all sorts of other things. But I think helping give them this perspective helps them jump into the fray. The mass highway guidelines are in fact now being looked at as being considered complete streets guidelines. Who's familiar with the term complete streets? Just making sure. So the idea there is anytime we touch a road, we take into account all four user groups, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, and motor vehicles. We really have uh, tried to make that a part of how we do uh, um, all roadway planning in Massachusetts. So to recap, of my five choices, I definitely went and talked to the highway manual guys. I do go to my local, did go to my local planning board meeting. I went to America on the move, but not to talk about pedometers and t-shirts and water bottles. I put the flame on them and I said, look, if you're going to be out there getting people to walk, give them walkability checklists. Turn every one of them into an advocate. Get them to show up at planning board meetings so that we build the sidewalks. And I think that's what we do when we do that kind of outreach and education. And I did the DVD just because I had time, but I didn't go to the health fair. And my point is, you guys voted differently than you have behaved historically, at least recent history. And you were honest with me, and I appreciate that. But I'm going to suggest our behavior should reflect what our intellect understands we should be spending our time on. You all voted for the stuff you thought was the right thing to spend your time on. I think you voted with me around systemic change. Now have your behavior reflect that. And if your boss isn't on board and they're not here in the room, then go home and lay it on them and say, this is what we got to be spending our time on. Because communities are making progress, but how do they get there? Well, I think my observation looking around the country, they're doing all three Ps. They're not just doing the kind of classic programs we've done, the outreach, the education, the encouragement events, the health fairs, the walks, all that stuff. But they are going through to the project level. They are actually trying to change the physical infrastructure of the environment so that it is stickier for physical activity and even better changing the policies. 
right? Because I don't want to have to go in subdivision by subdivision, rebuild sidewalks that weren't put in the first place. I want my subdivision ordinance to require sidewalks right from the beginning, and then I want them to be put in place, right? So policy, more powerful than project, which is much more powerful than just program. And if I'm going to do programs, I'm going to make them stickier. So I'm going to do safe routes to school, where I launch walking school buses, right? Designated routes to school and adult walks, picking kids up along the way with a fixed schedule. My wife did one in our neighborhood, very successful. Um, or when we're going to do a walking event, I hand people walkability checklists. I bring a facilitator, and we go out and we talk about what could make this an easier and more pleasant place to walk. What would get you to walk here on a regular basis for functional trips, not just recreation, to the corner store, to school, to your mother-in-law's house or your mom's house, whatever it is. Um, uh, bike sharing programs or even helping our wellness programs. You know, if we're gonna do a worksite wellness program, let's not just do a 12 week walking program that ends, let's actually try to convert people into routine pedestrians and bicyclists as part of how they commute. Let's build in real rewards for them. I know of workplaces that are doing things like giving you the cash equivalent of what your parking space would have cost if we provided one, as long as you show up with, without a car on a regular basis. Or perhaps we'll give you a discount on your healthcare premium. By the way, if you're going to do stuff like this, particularly on these walkabouts, and I'll talk about this in my breakout session, I just want to reiterate this, include kids. Don't just get the sort of the ready participants. Reach out to the very young, the very old, people across the spectrum. Kids in particular are not constrained by what, what we can't do. You know, they haven't been beaten down by, oh, we could never do it that way. So kids are great contributors to these walking workshops. They're really, really thoughtful. Those are some drawings they made in workshops we were doing in Nogales, Arizona. Those are the kids up there in a special summer program. Um, with regard to the projects, everybody thinks it's the really expensive stuff, the million dollar new roundabout, you know, things like that. But it could also be just the conversion of a small four-way stop sign to a small mini circle or roundabout in the neighborhood. Or as we talked about before, the installation of bike racks. Um, or it could be very inexpensive stuff like striping a bike lane or how about a, a community built trail. So it's not one that the city does at all, it's the scouts that have adopted this section of trail. That was up in the North Country near uh, Fort Drum. Um, uh, um, and it's a scout troop that helps maintain the trail. Or how about just signage? So that sign from Delray Beach, Florida, the circles, you're in the middle and it says you are here, and the circles represent a five minute and a 10 minute and a 20 minute walk. So they are assuming, if you're looking at this map, we're gonna encourage you to walk to your destination by telling you how short it is. We found that if you tell people distances, they spend so little time walking in America that if you say it's a half mile, they go, oh my God, that'd take forever. I don't know, what's a half mile? Does that take like an hour to get there? God forbid you say a mile. That's like ah, infinity off the edge of the planet, isn't it? I think you fall into the abyss. Now I tell them a 10 minute walk. They go, I can walk that. Yeah, 10 minutes. That'll be nice. So signage that, you know, simple things like that can actually make a difference. And at the policy level, it's things like, what do we clear for our snow clearing? Where do we draw our school district lines? Do we build our district lines to try to maximize the number of kids that can walk and bicycle? Do we have no bus zones that are actually reasonable? Uh, are the facilities there? Um, how we build new housing, building trails, um, uh, sidewalks, pathways, all of that stuff. And let me just share, Kathy, um, uh, Varney, and Jessica is, is two people who I have worked with before here in Glens Falls and up in Essex County, shared some of the stuff Kathy was telling me about the roundabout just down the road here on the walkabout, we'll go to it if you're inclined. Um, you can imagine people scoffed at that. They do in most communities. When that first comes in and the engineers propose it, everybody says, oh my God, people are gonna get in that circle and not know how to get out. They'll just go around forever. They won't, they'll just circle and circle. You know, we have elderly drivers in this community. They'll never be able to, I'm serious. And you know, it's gonna cause collisions and huge delays. And here's the problem. Um, many people make an emotional argument rather than an evidence-based one because we have evidence. We've now studied these enough and we know properly designed, compact enough to slow speeds with good design attributes like quality pedestrian crossings like these here, set back intersections with separator islands. These things actually can maintain flows, reduce both the frequency and severity of collisions. And uh, if, if I understand correctly, people are a lot less uptight about it than they were then. And Back to my point, we've got to show up. The Healthy Heart Program was one of the vocal supporters of, of, of the Roundup being an appropriate enterprise to make it safer for everybody, for motor vehicle users, as well as pedestrians and bicyclists, right? And those are the kinds of conversations we should be in. If I had a choice, and I could be at a health fair, or I could be at the public meeting to make sure I add my voice to those supporting the Roundabout, I don't want to sound unkind, but I'd go to the meeting. Because remember what we said about the health fair, not so sticky. This is a hugely sticky change. And it's just an example, I'm just giving it as one. As are all the street crossings, as are the pedestrian flags they're using, they're using all sorts of innovative crossing techniques and trying to build on that. Um, 
Um, what about complete streets? Well, let me just say this. That is, there is a national movement. There is legislation pending still here in the state, right? That hasn't been finished out yet. And, uh, and, um, and the, uh, the premise is fairly straightforward. Um, but what we have to do, we have, we're getting pushback. So groups like um, uh, uh, the, the associations of both county and a town highway superintendents have a memorandum of opposition to complete streets. They claim it's an unfunded mandate. So this is a little quote from inside there. And uh, let me be clear, by the way, as an, my, an engineer, I got to be, every highway guideline is an unfunded mandate. Every rule about, there's an entire manual called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and it says, at an intersection, this is how the stop sign must be used, blah, 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 blah. Lanes, they're all unfunded mandates. We expect you to figure out how you're going to pay for this stuff. Now you get some state funds, you get some local funds, you use your money. So this is a, a, a really vapid argument, the notion it's an unfunded mandate. Now, if they make the case there are some places where we simply can't do it, the right of way, there's a steep wall here and there, we don't own enough right of way, I acknowledge that. But I think as a principle, the notion that we always think about all four user groups, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, motor vehicles, before we conclude the design, I think is a perfectly reasonable, in fact, it is a mandatory expectation. And I would go so far as to say you all should be part of the conversation. Who here has been involved in this dialogue, either signed on to a letter of support or in any way weighed in? Rhetoric, not a rhetorical question. I'm trying to get a sense of the room. So a handful, okay. We should quadruple that number because that's about a quarter of the room. So everybody should be giving voice to this. Even if all you're doing is, in a positive way, reaching out to your highway department and saying, look, we're not saying it's a bike lane on every street. It has a different character. A rural road, it just might be making sure when we do our next repair, we expand the shoulders. Um, it might be sidewalks and trails to key destinations like the school up in Willsboro. Oh, but in, in an urban environment that is in our towns, sure, wide sidewalks of, of more sort of higher quality. But acknowledging that it's going to be different designs for different locations. Nobody's saying stripe a bike lane on every road in, in New York State. Nobody's saying that. We need to be clear, but we are saying always ask the question, what's the right treatment for the set? And um, there are communities out there actually passing local resolutions. Anybody other than Elizabethtown, I know about the work you're doing, has anybody else approached the notion of a, of a complete streets resolution policy statement being passed? All right, this is a wonderful to-do because it is the first step on this progressive idea here is simply to get city council and or mayor to sign on a kind of whereas be it resolved policy statement. It need not even have any more force than whereas public health, the environment, local economics, safety will all be positively affected. Be it resolved, we will always endeavor to take into account all four user groups on any roadway project we do. Right, and there are models of that kind of language. Um, but the next phase would then be to work with the highway department, with public works, and say, okay, what does that mean as far as practical details in your guidelines? How can we help you get to a place uh, that you can do that? I want to share the story of this guy, Jim Ogle, who I met in, uh, a couple of years ago at a national workshop that I was doing, Pioneering Healthier Communities as a YMCA initiative. But the point is this. The guy came in, he, he gave out pedometers, he said, my God, I average about 3,700 steps a day. But he was part of their local initiative and he's the local media guy. WIBW was their local TV and radio station. A year later, I visited with them at a big conference in Kansas, and he comes up to me with pride to tell me two things. One, he was averaging more like 15,000 steps a day, three things. 15,000 steps a day. Two, he had lost about 70 pounds. I mean, he looked markedly different. Three, he proudly showed me how he broke his arm mountain biking. He said, dude, a year ago, I would have never even got on one of those things. He goes, I was ripping down the hill, man. I mean, he sees himself as an athlete now. I was, God forbid, the arm was, I said, thank God it wasn't worse, you know. And you'd be blaming me. No, and he said, no, I'm not mad at you. He says, I would have never mountain biked. But more importantly, his station, and this is a really important thing, totally invested itself in their community-wide health initiative, which included joining with the Department of Public Works on their Fix the Streets campaign, in which they helped pass a half-cent sales tax charge. They got it passed by public referendum. referendum. So in 2008, this community vote no, nine, 2009 community voted to tax itself more to fix its streets. Now they knew there were potholes and stuff. This, his radio station led the charge, and once they got the policy passed, the deal they made with DPW is, we'll help you get the money to do the work. You've got to work with us on making sure as much as possible all the projects are complete streets projects. What do you think Public Works said? Sounds good to me. You, if we can get out there and fix the streets, we'll be looking at anywhere we can stripe a bike lane, repair sidewalks, do all that, safer crossings. We are in, because that's their intent. They want to do the right thing. It's often the lack of dollars. Well, they helped them get the dollars. They passed it in 2009. Both the, the sales tax surcharge and city council passed this complete street statement. 
They've changed the landscape there. I told them, you guys, if your group disappeared tomorrow, you will have lasted, left a lasting and sticky impact on the health of your community. But, and I'm not trying to embarrass you, Jessica, but she shared with me some of the kinds of things happening right here in Essex County, a little closer to home. You're saying, oh yeah, that's Topeka, I don't know, could we do it here? Well, they've got a, a local Complete Streets Coalition, they've got a working group that includes people from not just public health, but public works and planning and transportation and DPW supervisors at the county level. Um, they're doing a smart growth application for active transportation and a recreation plan for the thing. I love the notion of an active transportation plan. It says we're not just talking about people going on trails or sidewalks because they're working out. We're talking about being able to transport ourselves actively from one place to another. So kids walking to school, seniors walking to the local store to shop. Though, and a mini grant program that includes improvements, some of them modest. It could be painting crosswalks, installing bike racks. Um, some of this stuff is not rocket science. It's just facilitating a conversation that most people, once you explain it to them, would nod their heads. By the way, is this the bridge you guys are thinking about trying to redo? Yeah, it's, it's, part right now. it's actually been discontinued. Jeez, and I always wanted to go and jump because of the no diving and jumping <laughs> sign. I thought before it goes, I should jump at least once, my inner. Troublemaker. You remember the, how many of you did things when, that when parents couldn't be involved? Yeah, I was that guy. Um, um, and I would urge you, as you think about trails, to think about trails not, again, as recreational corridors only, but as actual transportation corridors. So even up at Willsboro, tiny little, I mean, there's barely a town center to speak of, but they have a, a little trail and a sidewalk combination that connects town hall and a couple of their businesses to where the schools are, and you can walk more safely between them rather than out on the road. Remember my three Ps, you know, you can use all three. The, the program level on trails could be to create a Friends of the Trail group, to have trail cleanup days, uh, to raise endowment funds for, for maintenance over time. The project would be actually designing and building the functional links, but the policy would be, look, we never touch a road, we never build another subdivision without thinking about where the trail goes and building it in. Now you say to me, Mark, we're not building subdivisions right now, the economy's in the tank. This is exactly the time to update policies. If you were ever going to work on a zoning ordinance or a complete streets policy, it's when a not a lot of construction is happening. Let me be clear. Once you get to the point where we're back in the go-go days and there's a lot of building happening, that's when we have the friction. The developers are going to push back. They're going to say, we don't want these additional requirements. Right now, nobody's even talking about this stuff. This is the time to look at things like zoning ordinances, trail requirements. And I will go conclude by saying, I think safe routes to school has huge promise. You're going to say to me, Mark, rural schools, at least half of our kids come from more than a walking distance away. Remember the premise, as many kids as possible, more safe physical activity more of the time. If they are close and it's safe enough, get them to walk and bike now. And where they're not close or it's not safe enough, try to improve the conditions. Because we get health and safety benefits, but we even get academic benefits. We know more physically active kids, perform better on standardized tests, all of that kind of stuff. Um, these is from the, the work we did over at the Abe Wing Elementary when we went over and visited there. Very enlightened principal um, at the time who was really dedicated to this. She says, I know if my kids are walking and bicycling to school, they come more ready to learn. Their, um, the, the Safe Routes to School National Program actually talks about a formula of five E's, which is the same as the three P's. It's the programmatic stuff like education and enforcement and encouragement programs. It's the project stuff like the engineering. And then it's, of course, the policy, changing the rules on pick up and drop off. So enforcement might be is, is convincing parents not to be dropping off on the left side of the street facing oncoming traffic. Or it might just be the installation of crossing guards. You know, it's not elaborate stuff. But of the five E's, I cannot overstate this, the fifth E is the most important evaluation. And it is, in fact, the first thing you do. First thing to do is find out how are kids getting to the school, by what travel mode, and why. How many kids are walking and bicycling? How many are being driven by mom and dad, and why? And just so you know, all of the tools to do this, tally sheets, parent surveys, they all exist on the National Safe Routes to School website. Has anybody used any of this stuff yet? Has anybody done any of this? Did you download stuff from the Safe Routes website? Was it helpful? It, yes, you're saying? I, I just wanted to make sure. You can tell me if it wasn't, but my experience has been people say it's, it's turnkey. They will even let you, you can submit the data to them and they'll crunch the numbers and give you back graphics and everything that show you morning and afternoon comparisons of while kids walk. Anyway, the point of this story is simply once you evaluate, you can know. So in some communities, the kids will tell us, well, the parents will say we don't let the kids walk to school because there are a lot of stray dogs. So the enforcement program would be a dog enforcement. It's not about speed, it's about getting, you know, enforcing leash laws. In another community, you'll find that everybody says, well, if I could just get across this one street, I'd let my kid walk, because the rest of the way, there's good sidewalks and straight. Okay, good, maybe that's where we install the crossing guard or put in a, a light, a signalized intersection. 
Um, and to go a step further, to reach every kid, maybe we need to do walking before and after and at school. So there are communities where uh, at, when the kids arrive, there are opportunities to walk in Dyersburg, Tennessee. They built a walking path out in the backyard. And when the kids arrive early, it's a very low income school. A lot of kids come in for breakfast. And they, they say after breakfast, or before, either way, you can go out and walk. They have popsicle sticks. You earn a stick for each lap. They have a walk a marathon program. They have prizes every time you complete one. Um, so even kids coming by car and by bus are able to do it. Or in Columbia, Tennessee, what they realized was they had a park right next to the school. And so they've actually built a remote drop-off location for the buses at the opposite end of the park. It's only about a 12-minute walk through the park to the school. But the result is that these kids now are, even the ones coming by bus, are being dropped off. That eased up the traffic jam. Parents are now starting to drop off down there too, so it's much cleaner. They've set up walking school buses for the kids who live close enough, and ready for this? They give the kids who are walking to and from school, or even just walking to the remote pickup and drop off, a five minute early release. So they say, the idea is we're gonna move all the pedestrians off the campus before we start moving the cars to the pickup and drop off line. Huge incentive. We have heard kids in settings like that actually say to their mom, mom, please don't pick me up at the school. Go to the far end of the park or let me walk home because we get out like an hour early if, <laughs> if you don't pick me up. Five minutes, right? But you know how a kid brain is. P policy. Change the rules. By the way, the bless his soul, the principal at this school who adopted all this as a rule, this is the policy now, these new procedures is now the superintendent of schools in that district. Young guy, originally from New York. He still wears a Mets cap. We're out there directing traffic, he's got his Mets cap on. And he's now the superintendent, he's rolling it out to all the schools in his district. He says, I'm gonna actually show a measurable decrease in cost because I'm gonna be able to eliminate a couple of buses when all is said and done. Talk about enlightened, right? Now I'm thinking public health, he's thinking dollars, doesn't matter, we're all in the game together. And I, again, not to give short shrift to the nutrition side of the equation, you're going to have great breakout sessions on this stuff, but more and more we're realizing the three P's apply, whether it's the programmatic stuff like a rotating or a virtual farmer's market. Why do we only have one farmer's market right downtown on Saturday mornings? How about a church parking lot in one of the lower income communities hosting it on Wednesday afternoons, reaching out to the very communities that may not come to the one in the downtown area? Or how about community gardens that are attached to the curriculum at the schools and to the senior center so that we have stewards even through the summer months? Or looking at our zoning to look at where our food deserts are, those areas where there isn't good access to fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and saying, what would it take to get in there? Maybe even working in with the existing stores, the mini marts, and saying, what do you need? Do you need a loan for chillers and refrigeration for the produce? What, you know, what would help us get healthier options in there? Um, oh, this is a food desert map from uh, Owensboro, Kentucky, a more urban environment. That is, it's more like being in Glens Falls, not in one of the smaller communities. But I will say this about it. When they actually mapped the grocery stores, the red dots, and the convenience stores, the green, they were blown away how much of this kind of convenience food, which is really low quality. It's, think the, those hot dogs that rotate on the little thing all day long, and everything is prepackaged, high fat, high sugar, high salt contents. And they said very easily they could identify two areas where population was fairly dense, no fresh fruits and vegetables available. And so those are their targeting for redevelopment of, of healthy options. OK, home stretch, here it is. If you have not connected with these kind of people in your community, this is the next, your next to do would be to have a lunch date with any and preferably all of these people. And I'm not just talking the person in your transportation or public works department, a city councilor, or commissioner. Go to the private sector. How about one of your biggest employers? How about a private developer, somebody who does occasionally build homes in the community? In other words, these are all people that need to be our allies. And the conversation isn't, what are you gonna do for me? I'm trying to improve the health of the county. The question is gonna be, I'm trying to improve the health of the county and I think a lot of what I wanna do aligns with your goals. How can I help you? Very different way to have the conversation. It's that you've said that's just how you reached out to public works, and I've seen in communities all over the country, you know, it's, it's very effective because they are not the bad guys necessarily. These are resources, and by the way, you'll have a copy of, I'm, I'm gonna give Penny this, so we'll put it up on the site, I assume. You put these PowerPoints up on the website, right, Penny? Are you in here? And yeah, there she is, and you're nodding. Can we make these available? Yeah, okay. Yep, so, so all these websites, these are just some of the national organizations and websites. Uh, and these are all the reasons to do this, stuff I've talked about, the 4,000 pedestrian deaths, the 40,000 that die in motor vehicles, but the 400,000 that die due to sedentary living and poor nutrition. And you know, global warming, air quality, our dependence on foreign oil, all of that. But I'm gonna boil it down to a little story that some of you may have heard me tell before, a guy I met in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, walking across a bridge that connects an island, City Island Park, out in the river, 
that has like a zoo and a minor league baseball diamond on it, so it's a good sized island, to the downtown in the distance there. And they've done nice trails and they turned the bridge, what used to be for cars, into only a bike and pedestrian bridge. And they've got another bridge for cars now. And I'm taking pictures and I'm looking for stories and I'm saying to the guy, hey, uh, you get a lot of exercise because of this really cool bridge, great place to walk. He goes, uh, no, not really. I say, well, where are you going? He goes, I'm walking out to the island. I'm looking for a story, right? He's got nothing for me. Uh, and, he says, and I say, where? Uh, he says, well, I park at the island because the baseball diamond, the games are at night, so they only charge a dollar to park all day. Where are you coming from? Downtown by the state capitol. Well, why don't you park down there? Oh, it's like eight bucks a day. And they've done this traffic calming, you know, where they bumped out and they put some roundabouts so the traffic's a little slower. It's just actually easier. I can get back and back. Well, how long does it take you? He says, oh, probably only 15 minutes each way. And how often do you do that? And I'm thinking he's going to say once a year I have to go down for a license or something. Oh, every day I work down there. Now, I had said to the guy, think about it, do you get any exercise because of the bridge? And what did he say? How much physical activity is he getting? 30 minutes, five days a week if he really parks out here all the time. But he doesn't think he's getting exercise. He thinks he's saving $7 a day on parking. $35 a week, $140 bucks a month. Da, da, da. All right. And frankly, that's great, and I don't care, right? Because remember, we don't care if he loses a pound. We don't, it really doesn't matter. If he's regularly physically active, if that's all he does, we know he's gonna be uh, present at work more often and more productive when he's there. He's gonna take fewer absences, he will make fewer healthcare claims, he'll cost his employer less, have a lower chronic disease risk profile, profile live a longer, healthier life. Don't argue with me about that, because the data's clear. If he's moderately active every day, if I can get him to eat some fruits and vegetables too, and clean up his diet, I bet he loses some weight, he gets to a healthy weight without being on a diet, and in fact, he does it just by virtue of this routine activity and healthy eating. And no t-shirts and water bottles involved. It is because of a P project, build the nice walking bridge, right, pedestrian bridge, P project, downtown traffic calming, P policy, cheap parking on the island, P policy, more expensive parking downtown, right, and if I was really smart, I'd go to where he works, and I'd give out pedometers, and I'd go, here, here, have the pedometer. Hey, did you, get, we're all going to try to get an additional 2,000 steps for the next eight weeks. And did you know Bob found $1 parking out on the island? <laughs> and it's about 1,000 steps each way. How cool is that? So listen, here's the deal. For four weeks, park out on the island, I'll give you a t-shirt. Do it for eight weeks, I'll give you a water bottle. Right? So I have my P program. And I know that that'll help people get going, but it'll be much stickier because I'm doing it in a sticky environment. That's how we have to think about this. How do we create those environments? So if you're going to do P programs, you have a much higher likelihood of success. In fact, I'd pull back on the programs until I've enhanced stickiness so I create places for people to go and do it. And frankly, I don't, I'm not really so, you've got to be saying to yourself, this guy's like a raving froth at the mouth lunatic about this. But it's not really for Bob. Nor is it for any of you. Don't take it personally, but I don't really care about you guys one bit. I don't. You're big boys and girls. You're adults. You're going to make your own decisions. You are, right? I care about him, I think. How old are you? Oh, no, I don't even care about him. He's still old enough. I was hoping he was under 20, so I could at least call him a teen. You're very youthful looking. So here's the problem. If I'm not doing it for any of you, and I'm not doing it for myself, who am I doing it for? Specifically mine and their generation. This is mine frozen at three and five. They're now 13 and 15. You saw my daughter a little while ago. But I've frozen them in time at three and five to remind myself that they are part of the first generation that's gonna end up with statistically shorter life expectancies than their parents. And here is why I opened with my challenge and I told you I'm gonna make you squirm. Because we cannot waste a second on this or we're gonna lose that next generation. They're the generation that it looks like now is gonna to track to have one in three kids developing type two diabetes in their lifetime. That's what the data projects forward. Shorter life expectancies than their parents. This is mind blowing to me. Indeed, it is a sin that I can't imagine a generation could commit on the next if they knew what they were doing. If this were an infectious disease, we would be insane to get CDC to figure out what the vaccination is. We know the vaccination. We gotta design our communities differently. You can program till you're blue in the face. We got 20 years of data that says that's not doing it. Change how our communities live, how we eat, how we prepare our food, how we get it to us, how we move every day. That's our only hope. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. I know you guys care enough to be here that you're going to too. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure and an honor. And I'll look forward to working with you later. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.